Great to see everyone this morning. It's a beautiful day that the Lord has given us to be here. Every day that we can be here is a beautiful day, though, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> want to welcome our visitors. want to welcome everyone, but if you're visiting, we're especially glad that you're here with us. If you have the opportunity, there's a, uh, a guest book located out in the foyer. If you could uh, sign that for us, that would be great. And if you could stick around after the service this morning. So we can visit with you, get to know you. Uh, we know that God loves you and we'd like for you to know that we do too. So certainly like, certainly glad to see everyone here today. I'm not going to go over all those uh, that are in need of prayer in our, in our bulletin this morning. <clears throat> but there were a couple of uh, uh, late, uh, late changes. Uh, Mary Ann Perdue's friend uh, Danny Murphy. Uh, is having a quadruple bypass surgery today. So we want to remember uh, him in our prayers. Also, uh, uh, Brother James Taylor's sister, Helen Walls, passed away Friday evening. So we'll rem remember that family. Our cleanup day on August the 23rd, this is before our open house on the 24th, we're going to get together and clean windows and, and uh, uh, do some outside stuff. Uh, Paul apparently has some magic glass cleaner that's just going to take care of all the cleaning issues, except we're going to need buckets and mop buckets, uh, uh, brushes, some squeegees, things like that. But uh, uh, he says that uh, he's got the glass cleaner problem covered, so we'll see how that goes. But we do need you to bring a, a squeegee or two, maybe some brushes, and a ladder if you have one. Uh, to help us get these uh, windows and uh, doors and everything cleaned up. So, once again, good to see everyone. Uh, Brother Jim has got our singing this morning. Join him uh, wholeheartedly. And Brother Luke's got our lesson. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here, and I hope you'll join in the singing, praise God Almighty, and uh, be thankful for the other ones that are sitting beside you today. Allow them to sing and lead them with us, please. Every one of us needs to be singing. I'm going to need your help for sure. I know.
704 will be our song before prayer. We're going to sing the first two stanzas of this song twice, and the song will end at that point. We're going to start with it, and then we'll sing the bottom one once and go back to the top again. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day we can come together and sing praises to you, to lift up prayers to you, to hear a message from your word. We just pray today that as we go through this time together that we are concentrating our thoughts on you and how we can uh, rejuvenate our own lives and our own spiritual lives especially and so that we can take your word out into the world around us. Be with uh, Luke as he presents his lesson today that he can recall the things he has studied and the presentation that he wants to make to us. Continue to be with Jim as he leads us in our singing, that we can sing praises to you. We ask that you be with each one of us, that you can strengthen us, and that we can and edify each other as we go through this service today. We ask you to continue to be with those who have lost loved ones over this past week, with the Chisholm family, uh, with the uh, James Taylor, uh, his sister's family, just pray that you can comfort them in this time of loss, but also uh, if, if it can be a time of celebration as well, because it's a time that they, they can reach the goal that they have set forth uh, of living for you and having that hope of living, being with you in the next life. Continue to be with those who are sick, that they can be healed, uh, that they can be comforted. Those who are working with them can give them the best care that is in their ability. And just that they can have a, know that we are thinking of them and that we can provide comfort to them as well. Just continue to go through uh, with us throughout this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. <coughs> Five hundred twenty seven will be our song for the communion.
as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, let's remember Christ upon the cross and the reason that he's there. And as we partake of this unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine, let's remember that it represents the body of Christ and his blood that was shed for us. Will you bow with me in prayer, please? Our Holy Father, as we come before you, we bow our hearts and our minds as we dedicate ourselves to you. But all of this, Father, is because Jesus lives and because he died and because through that death he gave us the opportunity of everlasting life. And as we partake of this unleavened bread, Father, it reminds us of the sinless body of Jesus that died on that cross so that our sinful bodies might be forgiven and raised to walk in newness of life. So accept us now, Father, as we partake of these emblems that remind us of so much that is good and perfect. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Bow with me again, please. Our Holy Father, as we come before you now with bended knee, we remember the death of Jesus upon the cross and the shedding of his blood and the sinlessness of the life that was given so that our sinful lives could be forgiven. And as we partake of this unfermented grape juice, Father, we remember the sinlessness of Christ and of the blood that he shed on our behalf. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Will you bow with me again, please? Our Holy Father, we are always mindful that you are the giver of all good gifts. You've given us of yourself. You've given us life. You've given us your Holy Spirit. You've given us your Son. You've given us salvation. You give us every blessing that we enjoy each day. There's no end of your giving, Lord, and we thank you. And now we pray that you will accept these gifts from our hearts as a small expression of our gratitude and appreciation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where's Luke? Right here. You're next. <laughs> they tried my Lord.
Well, good morning. I can tell the mic is working today. You can hear me all right. I think we've got most of the glitches worked out of that. We're going to talk about the cross this morning. Not so much about the cross itself, but the one who is on it, for he's the one that matters. And not so much about the, the theological significance so much as the words that are spoken there. Now, this, this uh, sermon has been preached many, many times uh, by many, many preachers through the ages. But I am fascinated by the seven statements that Jesus makes from the cross. Imagine for just a moment that you are dying and you know that you are dying. And that your loved ones are, are gathered around your bed. What are you going to say to them? Are these going to be words about, well, who won the game last night? Or, you know, what your favorite color is? Things like that. <laughs> are they going to hold deep significance? Because your time uh, is short. My dad tells a story of standing at the bed of one of his favorite uncles and the, this gentleman leaned over and said always take care of your women and he said I've remembered that in my whole life and so as we look at these words that Jesus spoke from the cross this morning I want you to realize these are the words of a dying man and they are chosen carefully and each statement that is recorded in the gospels is intended to teach us something about the character of our savior but it's also intended to teach us something about ourself and about the mission uh, that we have. Jesus came to do many things. He was a teacher throughout his entire life. Started very, very young in the temple at the age of 12, and he amazed the teachers and the rabbis who were in the synagogues and in the temple because of his understanding of the law. And over and over, we see him teaching. We think of the Sermon on the Mount and so many other instances. And when he did those things, he taught from the hillside, he taught from the mountainside. He often uh, would go down to the shore of Galilee. Occasionally he would go out in a boat and he would use a boat as a pulpit so his voice could carry across the water to the people that were on the shore and he could teach. But for the last sermon, before he finally died, he needed an unforgettable pulpit. And there is no more memorable <clears throat> pulpit uh, than the cross that he died on. And there is no sermon that's ever been preached uh, that is more powerful and more memorable than the words that Jesus spoke from the cross. And his first word was to the world, to everyone. In Luke 23 and 34, it says, But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. I wonder if anybody standing there expected that. Forgive, forgiveness spoken to the world. What would you do if someone had hung you on a cross? Would you have cursed them? Would you have wished them uh, to suffer the same fate? Jesus spoke a word of forgiveness. And yet when we look at his character throughout his entire life, I suppose this is not as shocking as many would make it out to be. Jesus was always consistent. And throughout his life, he preached a message of forgiveness to those around him and around you and I. Christianity is about forgiveness. And so in Luke 6 and 27, Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who would curse you, pray for those who would mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, turn to him uh, the other also. The hypocrites that stood around him would have expected him to forget, forget that. But instead, he spoke words of mercy to the world. Forgive who exactly? Every year around Easter time, as I'm listening to various programs on religious channels, the, the question will come up, who crucified Jesus? And there'll be a Jewish rabbi on the panel, and then there'll be uh, some professional historian, and the Jewish rabbi will say, well, the Romans crucified Jesus. Uh, they were the ones that had the power uh, to uh, inflict uh, such a punishment for a crime. And then the, the, the historian will say, no, no, no. Well, actually, the Jews crucified Jesus, for they were the ones uh, who wanted that punishment carried out. And then somebody else will say, well, really, the bottom line is Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, he's the one that brought down the, the sentence, and so he crucified 
Jesus. Well, forgive who exactly? Well, what about the soldiers that put Jesus on the cross? Uh, What about Herod who dressed him up in a purple robe and called him a fool? What about the people who stood in the street and just cried crucify when Pilate asked, what should I do with him? Forgive who exactly, Jesus? And why would you forgive them? Notice what he says. He says, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. I am convinced to this very moment you and I have no concept of what really happens when we violate God's laws. If we really understood, I don't think we would. And so God looks down and he sees you and I and we think we're pretty bright. We think we're pretty intelligent. We think we have a hold of things. And the truth is, we're ignorant. We're ignorant of what we've done to the character of a holy God. We're ignorant of what we've done uh, to our relationship with him. And in a fascinating contrast, speaking about the angels, we're looking at Isaiah 6 again tonight, and there are beings that are in the presence of God called seraphim there. They are angels as far as we know. And they're in the presence of God, and the angels are in the presence of God. And here in 2 Peter 2 and 4, Peter makes a statement about the angels and sin, and he says, God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but he cast them into hell and committed them into pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Why didn't the angels receive a second chance? Because they're not ignorant of the holiness of God. They stand in his presence. For once, ignorance here is a good thing. The angels knew and there was no forgiveness. Well, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. Does that mean the whole world is just going to heaven? I mean, I can find people that preach that message. There is no sin. There is no hell. Jesus died on the cross. And as a result of that, everybody's just saved. And that's the end of it. Is that what happened? It isn't, is it? See, Jesus offers forgiveness to ignorant people like me and to the whole world who really don't understand the character of God or what we've done to to violate it. But we know that something's wrong, and we know we want to come back to God. And so Jesus on the cross offers it to you. And if you think this morning, if you're not a child of God, that you can't come to God, you're wrong. Jesus offers you The opportunity of forgiveness, no matter what has happened, no matter what you have done, there is no sin. The cross does not cover. Jesus was a perfect sacrifice for every sin that had ever been committed and ever would be committed. He died for everyone. And yet, that forgiveness had to be received and has to be received. And so 50 days later... After Jesus had been resurrected, after the Holy Spirit had come upon those apostles, after they had preached, or as they preached, uh, the first gospel sermon, and as all of these individuals gathered around them, probably somewhere in the temple complex, Peter said this in Acts 2 and 24, he said, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders. And signs which had been performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over to you by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you, this goes back to who who crucified Jesus? Well, Peter helps us. He says, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, and you put him to death. But God raised him up again putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. Something's happened here, hadn't it? Fifty days earlier, what did they do? They stood in the streets uh, with bloodthirsty intentions, and they said, give us Barabbas. We do not want this Jesus. And when Pilate said, what should I do with him? They said, crucify him. And they cried that from the very depths of their soul. And yet today, on this moment, At this moment, as Peter preaches in Acts 2 and 37, these same men say, brethren, what shall we do? See the attitude change? 
They knew Peter was right. They knew they had nailed Jesus to the cross. They knew they had cried for his blood. And they knew they were guilty of putting the sinless Son of God to death. And so they said, brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. And listen to this. We've, we've quoted this so many times we don't even hear it anymore. Repent and be baptized. Why, Peter? Why am I? Why am I repenting? Why am I believing? Why am I confessing Jesus uh, as my Savior? Why am I being baptized? Why is all this happening? So that you may have the forgiveness. The, the Greek actually uh, gives the, the, the picture of uh, moving from one state to another. So that you may move from a state of being unforgiven to a state of being forgiven of your sins. And receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Who crucified Jesus? Well, they did, didn't they? But why was he on the cross? He was on the cross for the sins of the whole world. So that means I had a hand in it. And so when everybody's trying to pass the buck for why Jesus is on the cross, I need to remember that I crucified him. That he died for my sins. He died uh, for yours. He died for mine. He died for everyone's. But I'm going to have to have that Forgiveness appropriated in my life. I'm going to have to receive it. John 1 and about verse 12. John says there as many as have received Jesus. He's given the right to be called uh, the sons and the daughters of God. Have you received the forgiveness of the cross? That's the first thing that Jesus offered. And then fast, in a fascinating turn. Uh, there is a man beside him who receives forgiveness from him. Jesus was crucified between two criminals, uh, two thieves. And to one of those thieves, Jesus turned and said, Today, you shall be with me in paradise. That's the second word from the cross. In Matthew 27 and 40, it says, The chief priests also, along with the scribes and the elders, were mocking him. And saying, he saved others and he cannot save himself. He is king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let him rescue him now if he delights in him. For he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him. But one thief that day that we know very little about had the courage to own Jesus. And in Luke 23 and 40, this thief speaks. And he says, Do you not even fear God? Since you are under the same sentence of condemnation. And we indeed are suffering justly. For we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. You see the contrast? The one that hangs there. The one that is the son of God does not deserve what he what he's receiving. And yet this man says, I'm getting exactly what I deserve. The cross is about not getting what I deserve. So he says of Jesus, but this man has done nothing wrong. So he sees his character. And then he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus broke his silence and says something fascinating. He looks at this thief as they both hang on the cross. And he says, today you will be with me. In paradise, and without spending a whole lot of time on it, the idea of paradise there uh, to a Jew uh, was heaven. And so Jesus said to him, today you will be with me in heaven. And so you can pick up a commentary, you can get online, if you punch this into a search engine, uh, and you ask the question, what does it mean to be saved like the thief on the cross? There'll be a million things come back, and people constantly ask the question, uh, can I be saved like the thief? On the cross. And my, my answer would be, uh, uh, can you be saved by being crucified? Uh, begging for the mercy of God. That's not what they mean. Uh, they mean, can I be saved without being baptized? Let me ask you this question. How do we know that the thief on the cross wasn't baptized? What do you know about him? What do you know about John the Baptist? Remember him? What did he do? He came baptizing in the Jordan, did he not? 
And what was his purpose? His purpose was to call the people back to God, to call the Jews back to God. And in John, or rather, not John, in Mark 1 and 4, John, or Mark says that John came baptizing in the desert and preaching a baptism of repentance. And what was, what's the rest of that statement? A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's entirely possible that the thief on the cross had been baptized by John. So when someone says, well, can I be saved without baptism? And they point to the thief, you have to prove that he wasn't baptized. So you have only half an argument. And you have to remember something else here about Jesus. When Jesus was on earth, you remember that whole episode where uh, some friends pulled a roof off a house and they lowered a guy, a paralytic, down to see Jesus? And Jesus looked at this man uh, who was laying on, on this cot, and he said, Son, your sins are forgiven. See, when Jesus was on earth, he often just forgave sin. He looked at someone and he knew the heart. Jesus could look inside you and know all about you. And he would just pronounce sins forgiven. So while Jesus was on earth, the forgiveness of sins was very different. And you have to also remember this. Jesus lived and died under the covenant of Moses. And so did the thief. And so baptism was not a part of the covenant that the thief lived under. In Hebrews 9 and 16, it says, For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. See, the new covenant, the covenant that you and I have, the one Jeremiah speaks about in Jeremiah 31, the agreement we have with God didn't come into effect until Jesus Died. And so Ephesians 2 and 15 says, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments. Jesus nailed the old covenant to the cross and he ended it with his death. That statement we read a moment ago in Acts 2.38, that's a commandment under the new covenant. And the thief on the cross never lived under the new covenant. But Mark 16 and 16 remains true. Under the new covenant, and it will until the end of time, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe, or he who disbelieves, shall be condemned. So somebody can argue over the thief on the cross all they want and how he was saved. Reality is it doesn't matter at all to you today. We live under an entirely different covenant. And whether or not we obey the new covenant, the covenant that is built and written in the blood of Christ uh, is a statement of life or death. It's a choice between heaven and hell, and it's your choice, and it's mine. So Jesus has spoken to the world. He's spoken to a thief, and now he will turn himself inward to his family. And the third word that he says is a word to his mother. And this is one of the most touching statements in all of scripture I cannot imagine what it would have been like to be her the life of Mary was one that one stands back and marvels at but you're thankful you didn't live it you know every little girl in Israel wanted to be the mother of the Messiah you know there's a old Chinese curse that says may you get what you want Mary was the mother of the Messiah, and she lived that life. And now she stands there, and she looks at him, dying the most excruciating death. By the way, that's where that word comes from, excruciating. It means out of the cross. Be careful how you use that word. Uh, when they crucified people, they realized that the pain was so great that they had to come up with a new word. To describe it. And so they came up with the word excruciating. And Mary stands there at the foot of that cross. And Jesus looks at her and he says, behold your son. He turns to John who also stands there. And then he says to John, behold your mother. He was her son, but he was always also her savior. And all she could do was stand there and she could watch him die. What went through her mind? Well, imagine the thoughts. 
There was the visit from the angel that said, you will be with child from the Holy Spirit. You know, how can this be? For I have not known a man. Uh, the, the, the power from on high will overshadow you. And Mary knew how she had come into the world. There was the terror of Herod to kill the children. And the flight, the flight into Egypt that followed. There was the time when everyone loved him. There was that period of popularity. And then there was the decline in which people realized uh, that he would never be the king that they wanted. They had taken Jesus to the temple as a young infant. And Simeon, who had been told that he would see the consecration of Israel by God himself, had taken that child, and he had looked at Mary, and he had said, he is built for greatness. But understand this, your life's going to be hard, and there's going to be a lot of pain, and even a sword will pierce your soul. And so here, Jesus broke his silence, and he said, woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. There are two Books in the New Testament written by the brothers of Jesus. They are James and Jude. But that came later. At this moment in time, his family didn't believe that he was the Messiah. His brothers were unbelievers. And so it was to John that Jesus turns and he says, I want you to take care of my mother. I think what I take away from this statement from the cross is even now, when you would look at Jesus and say, you know, you could take some time to think about yourself. He thought about others. He cared about what was going to happen to his mom and to his family. And so you and I can take a lesson from that and realize that throughout our whole life, even when we're dying, we need to be concerned about what is going to happen to those that we love. In 1 Timothy 5 and 8, it says, If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his own household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Jesus lived those words right to the very last moment of his death. And then, number four, Jesus turns and he speaks to God. And he says one word, one statement, that I'm not sure even what to even say to you about. Because for all the millions of pages that have been written in commentaries over the last two millennia, I think it's the most incomprehensible to us. Jesus looks to the Father. The Son looks to the Father. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And from noon to 3 p.m. there was darkness on the face of the earth, there's been a lot of catastrophes in the world, lots of terrible things that, it, that have happened, but the sun wasn't blotted out for three hours and darkness didn't engulf the face of the earth. And I suppose that is the only fitting metaphor, it's the only fitting picture that God could give to explain just how horrible sin really is. Even the sun hid its face. And God turned away from this Jesus that hung on the cross. And he laid the whole sins of the world on him. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And in that moment, after all those sacrifices had been offered through the ages, all the bulls that had been slayed, all of the sheep, all the turtle doves, everything that had been offered, in that moment, there is a perfect sacrifice made for sin. Hope is restored. You and I have a means of coming back to God. And the wrath of God was appeased and, this, and the justice of God was satisfied. And then Jesus said, number five, the fifth word he spoke, was a word of humanity. He says, I am thirsty. When I read about the God of the Old Testament or when I think about an infinite God, does anybody, do you associate with that? If somebody says that God is all-knowing and all-powerful, that he's always existed and that he always will, and that he cannot be tempted by evil, as James says in about James 1, 14 or so, does anybody associate, do you, do you look at that or do you read those words in the Bible and 
does it really come across to you as something that you, you, can, you can attach yourself to, that you can understand and you can identify with? Doesn't me, but I can identify with Jesus because God came and he lived here, see. And he knew what it was to be hot, he knew what it was to be cold, he knew what it was to not have the money you needed, he knew what it was to be tempted, he was tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. He knows what it is to live in the dirt and the dust of this world. And here he reminds me of that, see. He understands me. And I can understand God in the flesh. Jesus is a picture of God that I can identify, uh, that I can understand, uh, that helps me to know how I should live. And here his humanity speaks. And then finally, number six, or actually there's two more. He says, it is finished. What is finished? Everything God had planned from eternity for you and I. The scheme of redemption was planned, uh, finished. Satan was defeated. The battle was won. Not a battle anybody really even understood needed to be fought. And certainly in no way that we would fight a battle. But the blood of Jesus defeated sin and defeated Satan. And so he had done all that he had come to do. And number seven, he says, finally, what we all want to say when we come to the end. Into your hands, Father. I commend my spirit. And he gave up the spirit. And he went back home to the Father where we all want to go. That's not the end of the story, is it? He didn't stay in the grave. He taught us so much in his death. But three days later, he wasn't finished. For he arose. And in doing so, he offered immortality to all of those. Who would follow him. So you and I need to speak about a crucified Savior. Because we need the blood of that cross to cover our sins. We need it every moment that we live. But we also need to live for every day. A risen Lord. And we need to understand that he is reigning. uh, And that he is alive. Jesus has finished his work. But what about you and I? What are we going to do? With what he has done for us. He's laid the foundation. He built the church. He gave the purchase price. For you and I. So that the church might exist. And that we might know what it is to be. In that. Place. He went to Calvary for you. He went to Calvary for me. He died for each of us. But each of us. Have to decide to die. For him. Have you made that decision? Are you going to live. For Jesus? A lot of people say that. Let me let you in a little secret. That's really hard to do. And unless you're intending this morning to live for Jesus, unless you have focused, unless you have decided and you get up every day and that's what you're going to do, then you're not. And you won't. Jesus went to the cross because he intended to go. And you and I... We'll only live for that Savior if we intend to do so. Do you need to give your life this morning to the one who died for you? Do you need to obey the gospel? Do you need to restore your relationship to the God who's given you life? If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and sing.
Thank you, Brother Luke, for a great lesson this morning. I appreciate it very much. Thank each and every one of you for being here and worshiping with us today. If you are visiting, we want you to come back at every top opportunity that you may have. Our closing song is 134, The Lord's My Shepherd. <clears throat> The Our Father who art in heaven, we are indeed grateful that we've had this opportunity to gather here together to worship you and sing songs of praise unto your name. We thank you especially, Father, for that great gift you gave us. You sent your Son to earth to live a perfect life that we might have a sin offering that, that we can turn ourselves to. We pray, Father, for our Deacons and elders here, may they continue to lead us in the right way, and may we continue to respond in the right way. We pray for our sick, may they, your healing hand be upon them. They restore themselves to their rightful place and take their normal lives. As we leave this place today, and we go about our lives, and we meet people through the week, let us be known as Christians and seen as Christians and say so. This we ask in Jesus' name, amen.